irregularly irregular rhythm blood pressure 100 by 70 respiratory rate 35 per minute and inspiratory crept crept all over the lung field the diagnosis now most of the time heart failure patients if they are presenting to you in an acute stage they come with acute shortness of breath but actually the clinical presentation of heart failure can be variable so that means you have to judge every patient from that end that is the clinical presentation and then assess him for multiple things and that will try to learn in this lecture that on different clinical basis here I am presenting at present a case of shortness of breath. But heart failure can present clinically with a lot of things. It can be just lethargy and weakness. It can be fetal edema. It can be even stroke sometimes. It can be MI in a patient who's pre-existingly having heart failure with the etiology coming first and then you'll diagnose him as a heart failure. So it's, it's, it has a variable presentation in terms of clinical or signs and symptoms. But the commonest one is SOB. That's why I'm taking this scenario. Otherwise, heart failure patient can present with different signs and symptoms that I'm, I'll going to, I'll show you during my presentation. Now let's start the definition. Heart failure is a clinical syndrome that can result from any structural or functional cardiac disorder that impairs the ability of ventricle to fill with or eject blood. Now what we commonly have uh, uh, noticed whenever we ask someone to describe heart failure, most of the time the definition is so that inability of heart to pump blood. So this is also a heart failure, but that this this definition covers only systolic heart failure. Nowadays, the spectrum of heart failure is 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 in a way that this definition is covering every kind of heart failure. If you just concentrate on the words of this definition, any structural or functional disorder that impairs the ability of the ventricle to fill with or eject blood. That's very important to understand because we have different types of heart failure. Systolic heart failure with ejection fraction of less than 40%. Heart failure with Preserve ejection fraction where your patient has features of heart failure in his clinical presentation, but his ejection fraction is more than 50%. That means he's not having systolic heart failure. Then heart failure with marginally reduced yield. That a patient whose ejection fraction is between 40 to 50%. And that's why when you're saying that these three kind of heart failure, that definition of inability of heart to pump blood is not going to cover every kind of heart failure. That's why I remember that first definition I have told you. So we have basically three kinds of heart failure. Heart failure with reduced EF. Heart failure with marginally reduced EF and heart failure with preserved rejection fraction. And usually the features in uh, diastolic dysfunction kind of or is FPF, normal end diastolic volume, increased wall thickness and mass, high ratio of mass volume. While in HEF-REF, in these terms you have to remember these, HEF-REF and HEF-PEF. Nowadays, a number of times you may be hearing these terminologies. You have to think of when someone saying half ref what it means and what half pef means. So in half ref you have increased diastolic volume, decreased wall thickness, decrease or low ratio of mass to volume. Now today we are going to cover systolic heart failure. And that conventional definition. A systolic heart failure is a clinical syndrome 
usually due to LV systolic dysfunction, where EF is less than 40%, resulting in acute or chronic symptoms of cardiac pump failure. And you will see in the etiology, the etiology can be acute or chronic. When we see the causes of heart failure, common, the commonest ones are coronary artery disease and this coronary artery disease can either acutely, like an acute and extensive anterior wall MI leading to acute systolic heart failure or maybe chronically affecting LV function, progressive MIs and ultimately patient develops systolic dysfunction. Other causes may be hypertensive heart disease, prolonged, uncontrolled hypertension, ultimately leading to systolic heart failure. Alcohol use, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathies, valvular heart disease. These four fives are the commonest one. Rest of the things which can lead to heart failure may be pericardial or congenital heart disease, anemia, pyrotoxicosis, septicemia, Page's disease, atriovenous fistula. And there are numerous causes. Every kind of uh, medical condition, uh, infections, septicemias, viral connective tissue disorders. So this heart failure, if you go and read, the causes, even uh, uh, almost every condition, one way or the other, ultimately lead to. But remember, when you are diagnosing heart failure, you are diagnosing a syndrome. Syndrome means a condition with a combination of sign and symptoms. So that means you have to assess etiology. What's the reason behind it? And sometimes when you don't found any specific reason, reasons for the cardiac muscle disease, you label it as cardiomyopathy. Let's come to the physiological response of heart failure. What's happening when you have a heart failing? That's any structural problem in cardiac pumping activity leading to hypoperfusion of the peripheral organs. And the response to that hypoperfusion from the kidney, from the brain, from the sympathetic system is that renal adrenals that lead to release of renin angiotensin and aldosterone. And similarly, the carotid and LA baroreceptors, which are there because of overstretching. Because once heart is failing, it's not only leading to hypoperfusion of the peripheral organs, but also increasing in end diastolic volume and stretching of the myocardium. And these all lead to, in second step, renin angiotensin, aldosterone, and increased sympathetic activity, which ultimately leads to sodium and fluid retention leads to tachycardia, which leads to vasoconstriction. And this all compensatory mechanism initially helps the heart to cope with, with this failing situation. And by means of this compensatory mechanism, it keeps the patient asymptomatic by means of that. And that's very important to understand that initially, when you have mildly reduced EF, patient is asymptomatic, but his myocardium has started compromising. Initially, he has no symptoms because of this compensatory mechanism. But later on, this particular compensatory mechanism overshoots or go beyond a certain limit and leads to symptoms. And we'll, when we'll come to management and treatment strategy, you'll come to know the treatment is to bring this compensatory mechanism within that parameter, within that threshold that it should be overdoing and it shouldn't be underdoing. If it's going to underdo, then your patient start developing shock, hypotension and may this again lead to complications. 
but it's overshooting and you you have to keep that compensatory mechanism in that particular spectrum where it's not causing harm and you're not really knocking this down whole compensatory mechanism that's very important to understand in the management of heart failure and this pathophysiological mechanism meaning by adrenals better receptor increase in pathetic activity renin angiotensin system this all lead to increase volume that is increase preload state of the to the heart and increase afterload increase sympathetic tone and similarly increase force of contraction also leads to exhaustion of the lv myocardium by means of tachycardia and over activity and this pathology leads to dyspnea fatigue exertional limitation weight gain poor appetite cough and many more symptoms these are the commonest one and the signs you see both of these either hypoperfusion or volume overload or increased sympathetic activity leading to tachycardia tachypnea edema and ascites jugular venous distension pulmonary waves pleural effusion hepatosplenomegaly cardiomegaly and s3 gallop and there are much more as well here i am just mentioning the common sign and symptoms then you have to investigate your patient now the primary investigations the objective behind the investigation is not only to diagnose heart failure but also look on to the etiology search for any aggravating factor in your patient that's very important and then we'll we'll see in that particular case when we'll be doing that case so ekg is important which helps you a lot in a way that simple ecg will give you evidence of ischemia infarction chamber enlargement any rhythm abnormality chest x ray give you cardiac size of your patient evidence of pulmonary pulmonary vascularity and any alternative diagnosis you are thinking of then some blood workup is needed with a cbc renal function electrolytes beta natriuretic peptide nowadays a very important excluding or including criteria and after that assessment of lv function by echocardiography this is the basic investigational workup but then if your clinical judgment is giving you a clue towards any specific condition and these preliminary tests are also further uh, you can say uh, 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 making your suspicion strong towards any specific etiology then you have to do specific tests for that particular etiology as well now let's come remember that pathophysiology which we have discussed right now now think of management strategy and what in this chart i'll i'm going to cover is the simple and common management strategy the baseline or preliminary treatment strategy for any heart failure patient but actually treatment depends on what kind of complication your patient has developed is he having any rhythm issues or not what is his functional class is he improving on your conventional medical treatment then you can add on further treatments as well that i finally conclude at the end but in this chart i'll just discuss the preliminary obligatory class 1 treatment for every heart failure patient now if you just concentrate on this chart which is showing you the pathophysiology lv dysfunction increase sympathetic activity epinephrine norepinephrine increase renin angiotensin increase adrenal stimulation leading to all those things which are happening in a way and leading to sodium and water retention increase vasoconstriction increase force of contraction tachycardia and all that so these are the different drugs which are used like beta blockers and this is for taking care of sympathetic activity that helps in taking care of force of contraction of the heart tachycardias then you have ace inhibitors which prevent conversion of ace 1 to ace 2 in that renin angiotensin systems you can use arbs but not both simultaneously either ace or arbs you can use aldosterone antagonist in which you can have spironolactone or 
इंक्रीजिंग Uh, the uh, amount of uh, beta natriuretic peptide and keeping it for a longer period of time in uh, in the system so that is uh, again a drug after understanding the pathophysiology the rationale for treatment in heart failure it's very important to assess your patient's functional class it has a lot of impact on management strategy on adding or subtracting drugs seeing whether your patient is improving deteriorating or static on your medical treatment and then can only be judged if you know how to assess the functional class of your patient like class 1 patient with cardiac disease but no limitation of physical activity that is is having no symptoms on routine activity a class 2 is a ordinary activity causes fatigue palpitation dyspnea or angina pain class 3 less than ordinary activity causes fatigue palpitation dyspnea or pain and class 4 is symptom at rest after functional class it's again very important when you are judging a patient with heart failure is this the pure etiology that has led to instability because sometime the etiology is slow progressive and chronic and there must be some additional aggravating factor in that particular patient that has led to acute symptoms and for that reason you have to take care of that acute aggravating insult that has made your patient from unstable uh, from stable to unstable along with assessment of etiology and what are those aggravating factors which you have to look for in a patient of heart failure who is presenting to you with symptoms medications any new acute heart disease myocardial ischemia pregnancy arrhythmias hyper or hypothyroidism infections thromboembolism endocarditis obesity a hypertension physical activity dietary excess so that means when you are assessing a patient with heart failure you have to look for these three things that after making a suspicion with signs and symptoms that your patient is having a syndrome of that heart failure which we described right at the beginning in definition any functional or structural disorder leading to inability of heart with uh, to fill with or eject blood and the symptom status may be shortness of breath at him or any feature in which you are thinking that your patient may have a heart failure you have to first confirm the diagnosis that is he having heart failure second after when you are suspecting heart failure identify etiology what is the etiology any assessment of his functional class assess volume status assess prognosis assess cause and these all things are very important in the work up and let's come to the stages of heart failure these are the various stages when you are picking your patient at different stages and now see even stage a failure is a heart failure where you have no symptoms of heart failure just risk factors is a stage a heart failure heart failure risk factor no heart disease no symptoms now just think of examples of that b heart disease without symptoms and there are condition in which you started having compromise of lv function but no symptoms at all at that stage you will uh, keep your patient in stage b heart failure c is 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 a heart failure where you neither have any symptoms where you have an acute symptoms or symptoms anywhere in the in the past 
during the course of illness. So any symptomatic structural heart defect, heart failure patient would be considered in stage C. And D is refractory heart failure. You may have a heart failure, a stage of heart failure, where your drug treatment, your optimization of all the strategies will may not be benefiting your patient in terms of getting out of symptoms. So that's again very important to class your patient into these different stages A, B, C, D according to uh, their own uh, uh, status in a way that let's see stage A. Stage A is a category where your patient is having only risk factors, meaning by hypertension, diabetes, hypercholesteremia, family history, exposure to cardiotoxins, alcoholic. So that means any condition which can compromise heart should be seen as a stage A heart failure. And just think of that. If you haven't taken care of your patient at this stage properly, the patient may go into stage B of heart failure. And stage B meaning by an asymptomatic status where your patient is asymptomatic, but he, his LV has started compromisation. Let's see if you're taking hypertension at stage B, A, then left ventricular hypertrophy would be stage B of hypertension. Similarly, a patient is diabetic. In stage A, he's diabetic. In stage B, he's having a ischemic heart disease, a mild LV dysfunction, but without, sim without symptoms. And C is clear-cut symptomatic stage, and D is marked symptom, which is refractory to treatment. So always class your patient of hyper, uh, hypertension. Where is he right now? A, B, C, D. And you have to really make every effort to stop your patient from jumping from stage A to B, B to C, C to D, or slow down the course of this heart failure uh, progression. So that brings the patient to in a state that he'll, he'll acquire that refractory state at a very late age, or may not be able to went into that stage. But unfortunately, what we are seeing, we are seeing very commonly acute MIs at stage of 30s and 40s and they are going into symptom and refractory heart failure within 5 to 10 years of their preliminary illnesses. That a person diagnosed to have diabetes at a stage of, uh, at an age of 30 and he went into refractory heart failure within 40s. Now assume, just assume that how crippled he will be at say at age of 45, which is the most productive age for him, and he develops a refractory heart failure at that. And these are the management strategy at different stages of heart failure. Stage A, treat risk factor, avoid toxic ACE in selected patients. ACE in stage B, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, stage D, ACE beta blocker, diuretic, digoxin. And now you have additional management strategy as well, stage C, that I'll discuss at the end. And stage D, you may need a lot of palliative thing, heart transplant, assist devices, and all that. So that's very important to keep the pace of that progression very low with conventional treatment or conventional medication, you should be able to take care of your patient. Now, after discussing that all definition, pathophysiology and uh, other strategies, let's come to a diagnostic algorithm. How to approach towards a heart failure patient? A patient with suspected heart failure and non-acute onset. Assess heart failure probability. And in clinical history, you not need to go through all these. History of CAD, MI, history of arterial hypertension, exposure to cardiotoxin, use of diuretic, orthopnea, PND. So that means, again, if you judge that this all, all rhythm 
this all algorithm is showing again those three things at, at the time of presentation in a non acute onset patient you have to judge is your patient coming into that syndrome of heart failure if so what's the etiology what's the aggravating factor what is the functional class of your patient and what is the stage of your patient and then ecg and in acutely presenting failures those who are patient presenting acutely always just hypoxemia hypotension vital organ dysfunction because in an acutely presenting patient you have to judge whether you need uh, specialized care to this patient or not and again prior to that you have to judge is this heart failure and what is the precipitating uh, precipitating factor in that whenever you are encountering a newly symptomatic severe symptomatic patient now let's come to our patients which we will be covering in this scenario and nowadays the first algorithm is that you have to cover uh, uh, judge in this i haven't uh, uh, kept that as well that after your physical assessment ecg you have to do beta natriuretic peptide or nt pro bnp and if this nt pro bnp is negative that is the level is is below certain limits then you have excluded heart failure and if it's positive then you need lv function assessment that is echo so in this algorithm which i am describing right now the next step is bnp bnp positive then echocardiography and then further specific investigations according to your preliminary assessment now let's come to our case a 35 years male admitted with progressive increasing shortness of breath for two week with orthopnea and pnd for last three days with heart rate 110 irregularly regular blood pressure is this inspiratory tap all over the chest so it looks like that this patient is coming into that category of heart failure there is something wrong with the rhythm at the moment that may be an aggravating so you need a complete history of this patient and when there was a complete history taken and after that ecg here if you look on to the ecg it's showing poor progression r wave in anterior chest leads with irregularly regular rhythm certainly atrial fibrillation so it looks like that this young man have some ischemic event maybe an acute anterior wall mi in recent times and which is aggravated further with atrial fibrillation so he is a heart failure patient who's in acute pulmonary edema this ecg so much clues this ecg is giving to you because clinical scenario is is really favoring that this is an acute pulmonary edema heart failure patient with maybe aggravation this acute atrial fibrillation with pass ventricular rate has aggravated and he has some evidence of ischemia which may be recent or maybe old a q waves there so his echocardiography done which showed a kinetic anterior posterior wall i am not describing here the bnp levels which were sky high in this patient so after positive bnp which was very high a kinetic anterior posterior wall with ejection fraction of 35 40% stage c is in stage c heart failure according to the stages because he is symptomatic with heart failure and here he is having atrial fibrillation with pass ventricular rate may be an aggravating factor a probable etiology is ischemic heart disease now he need some acute management and long term management strategy and that we'll discuss in our treatment algorithm that what should be offered to this patient now acutely since he is in acute illness you have to take care of his heart rate irregularly rhythm and there are various ways of treating atrial fibrillation in heart failure depending on the age is it proximal persistent permanent you have to manage that i'm not going into the details but you have to take care of rate you have to take care of volume diuretics to offload him 
If it develops hypotension, maybe inotrope supports. Then assess the potential ischemia. If any hints of potential ischemia there, he may need cardiac catheterization. If not, then viability study and all that. And let's come to chronic long-term management according to this chart, which is there. Now, step one, look very carefully. This chart will summarize the total treatment or management strategy we offer to a heart failure patient. Step one, ACE or ARB, beta blocker, diuretic according to the volume status as needed. That is the first stage that you have to offer these three drugs to every heart failure patient. And rest depends on the condition, his prognosis, his behavior, on these treatments. Then what to do? Let's see. Step two. Your, if your patient is in functional class two to four, provided creatinine clearance greater than 30 ml and potassium less than five, you can add on aldosterone antagonist. Okay, so these are the preconditions for adding aldosterone antagonist. Second thing which you can do is if his blood pressure is everything is okay, but he's still symptomatic, you can add on ARNI that I have described previously in place of ACE or ARB. Similarly, if your patient is in place class 3, 4, you can add on hydralazine and nitrate, especially for black people. Then if your patient is having LV dysfunction less than 35%, 40 days post MI, still symptomatic, you can, you can add on, uh, think of putting an ICG. Similarly, CRTD, if he's having left bundle branch block along with less than 30% or QRS greater than 150. Similarly, if your patient is tachycardic, his baseline heart rate is greater than 70 and is he still symptomatic and he's taking tolerated doses of beta blocker, that means if you can still increase beta blocker, then you can't add on levoprotein. But he already on tolerated dose, but still his heart rate is greater than 70, you can add on levoprotein. And after that, in spite of these all, which I have discussed right now, the patient is still symptomatic. You can think of these all things, palliative care, transplant, LVAD, and further investigational study, any biopsy or anything, describe anything specific and then do according to that situation. So with that, we are coming to an end of our subject. I hope that may have give you some idea about definition, pathophysiology, rationale for treatment, management strategy, and a case-based scenario to how to judge your heart failure patient status. And in conclusion, I would say that heart failure incidence is increasing. Management needs proper patient assessment